Hey, Loretta, thanks for joining us today. As a way of getting started, tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure. Well, I was a college professor for 25 years and a parent, and I had studied human motivation from the social science perspective. And as you could imagine, I noticed that my children and my students were not always motivated in the way that the social science model, you know, if you do everything by the book, that people should be motivated. And so that motivated me to study the animal brain because I had read a little bit about one chemical and a little bit about another chemical. And these chemicals are the same in animals as humans, and they really do cause our motivation in a nonverbal way. So the more I read about them and connected the dots, the more amazed I was that these chemicals really explain everything that we experience on a daily life that we can't put into words because our verbal brain and our mammal brain are not on speaking terms. So that got me going. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I, I kind of had the same curiosity from a sales career standpoint in that everyone was talking this business talk, this rational, <laughs> logical talk, and but ended up happening was this very emotional thing. But then, then you just separating into motion and a logic. But like you, you start digging down deeper and deeper, and it comes to these chemicals, and that we think of ourselves as these very sophisticated, evolved creatures, but we're really not, are we? <laughs> Um, well, we don't need to put ourselves down, but we can say that um, we are not, uh, we don't act like animals all the time. So we do. <laughs> what I always say is we have two brains because we need both. They yes. have to work together. But if you think that your verbal brain is the whole story and your inner mammal is just something that you left behind long ago, it's so false. And we see that in others, but we don't see it in ourselves. That, that is so clear. And when I read your book or listened to your book on Audible, you know, it finally clicked to really get the science behind it instead of just guessing and using antidotes. Yes. Um, and you know what, though? Unfortunately, um, academic neuroscience doesn't acknowledge anything that I'm saying. So I really had to take early retirement to do my own thing. <laughs> but how can they not? I mean, because it's so clear. Well, fortunately, I think this is why I don't get attacked, because it's so clear. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't acknowledge it because they have an ideology that all of our unhappiness is caused by society and our culture, and not to acknowledge that animals are not happy all the time, and children are not happy all the time, and this is how our brain works. And let's, let's start with kind of the, the key issues that I see in sales today, and pe salespeople are getting rejected so much, and I, I think it comes down to that oxytocin thing. Because, which is really the root of trust and tribalism. And people think of this as logical. There's no logic to this at all. Yeah, it's so painful. Um, it's, it's the oxytocin thing, but it's also dopamine and serotonin because dopamine is the expectation of a reward. And that motivates you to take the next step. And then when you take a few steps and don't get the reward, then what do you do? So salespeople are really more advanced on that than many others, but it's still painful. Yeah. Now, the serotonin thing is the, the calm confidence of feeling your own power in comparison to others. And again, when you expect to make a sale, you anticipate being in the one-up position. That's the natural mammalian impulse. And then when you don't get it, you lose out on the serotonin. And then the oxytocin, yes, is the feeling of acceptance. And when you're rejected, it's harder to feel accepted. And I think salespeople get into this uh, downward spiral because they don't yeah. get the reward and they start yeah. to believe that uh, and, and rationalize that they will never get the reward again. Yeah. yeah. And, and if you see them after 20 or 30 years, they start rationalizing that it's uh, their age 
uh, yeah. it's discrimination, yeah. it's yeah. the economy. Yes, exactly. Everything but themselves. Exactly. And everybody is like this, not just salespeople. And what makes it even <laughs> in terms of this rationalizing and blaming. Um, and then the other side of the coin is true also that when you have big scores, that you rationalize it. So there's a lot of unpredictability in life. And what makes it all more painful is social comparison. So it's amazing to learn that animals are constantly comparing themselves to others because that's how they avoid getting into a fight that they're going to lose. And so your brain is always comparing you to others, and that increases your pain effectively. You know? And that kind of drives some people yes. uh, and demotivates other people. Yeah. And that kind of uh, preset belief and even birth order. I don't know if you've ever looked at that, yeah. you know, where you have like the, the firstborn is typically the leader, the middle is always striving and, you know, fighting for attention. And then the youngest are, you know, the parents are mature. They know what Posting. they're <laughs> <laughs> Posting. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Well, all of my books talk about how we get wired by our own unique individual experience. And many people say that, you know, it's nature or nurture, but when they think of nurture, they think it means what society's formal messages are. But it's not. It's the random collection of experiences which differ for each child in a family and each individual. Yeah. <laughs> well, let's go back to that tribalism, because I think today people are having a super hard time approaching strangers. And, you know, I, and I just was watching a reality show where th these tribes uh, kind of team up to attack the invader. <laughs> right? what, what show is, oh, oh, a reality show? They're all the same, right? Oh, it was Southern Charm, but it was like, <laughs> okay. but there's always the, the enemy. There's always the villain. Exactly. And it changes. Exactly, exactly. So this is exactly how the mammal brain works, that mammals bond in the face of a common enemy. Yeah. So mammals are competitive and it's hard to get along with each other. And the only time they get along is when they bond against a common enemy. And the mind blowing example of this is that when explorers went to new lands in centuries past, the tribes they encountered had constant warfare with those local tribes. And in academic anthropology, this has all been covered up and we're made to believe that all of these non-industrial tribes were at peace and harmony and lived with nature and got along. It's totally untrue. I'm writing something about this now. And so this kind of conflict has been incessant in human life. And the fact is that we actually have less violence today and we get along better today. But we've gone so far on that road that you are expected to treat every stranger like they're your best friend and have no barriers at all. And that's not, it's not natural. So people feel threatened. Yeah. And that's it, because if you go to a museum, and I've used this analogy, uh, the paintings have one of two themes. When the, um, the invader lands, they're either killing the indigenous tribes or they're giving them a gift. Mm -hmm. And I think the gift switches from you're the enemy to, oh, you're part of the tribe. And I think that's yeah. when that switch, that oxytocin happens. Yeah, yeah. So here's the amazing thing. The brain learns from rewards and pain. And the brain is always learning from rewards and pain. And the important thing, because, you know, the, the explorers are always condemned, is that the tribes did the same thing. They were either attacking each other or giving each other gifts. Yeah. So that's how monkeys work, you know. They attack or they give each other gifts. That's how the mammal brain works. Yeah. Now, oh, and you know, with salespeople yeah. giving each other free tickets for a performance. <laughs> right. But it, that, and we see that all the time because um, when you go over somebody's house for dinner, um, you know, and I, certainly women are much better at this than men. Uh, they always bring a bottle of wine, flowers, 
dessert. And it's not the flowers, the bottle of wine, or the dessert. It's the token expression. And now, now you become part of it. And, yes. and when there's a new uh, neighbor, who becomes the most popular person in the neighborhood? It's the one who brings over the lasagna mm, yeah. or comes and introduces themselves. Yeah. And, and, and it's... Then- yeah, it's the expectation of a reward is what triggers our dopamine. And so when you're invited for dinner, of course, also the person who made the invitation is presenting the dinner. They're also offering a reward. And the way it works in the mammal brain is you reward others because you expect reciprocity. And so the whole idea currently in academia is that we're supposed to be altruistic. And they're covering up that anticipation of reciprocity. Now, when you bring the lasagna, what is the reciprocity? Or when you receive the lasagna, or maybe you don't want the lasagna because you don't want to be obligated to reciprocate. And as a college professor, the example that I always focus on is when my students would um, people would bond on the expectation that you would help each other cheat on an exam. And I think this is often a model for the dynamics in the world. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, but that's that bond. And I, I think I've, I've viewed this throughout my life that, you know, the people who I've been friends with my whole life, there was a one consistent pattern in that I helped them move once when we were in our early 20s. And it was that gesture bonded us for many years while other people kind of dissipated. And we see this with college roommates all the time, that they stay lifelong friends because they bonded for that one year or four years in school. They may not have had anything in common. Yes. And not only that, it was random that they ended up together. They didn't choose. So, Yes, exactly. So, but one thing that's important, uh, of course, I'm offering to help someone move. It's a great example that we all have the power to offer rewards and create bonds. But one thing is the neural circuits we build in youth become myelinated and they become any neural circuit that's highly developed, you use it effortlessly. So your oxytocin turns on easily in ways that triggered your oxytocin in the past. So when you offer trust, when you are receive trust, that builds a neural pathway. And when it happens when you're young, you learn to trust and receive trust in those particular ways. And it's harder to build oxytocin circuits later in life. But you can, but you already have distrust circuits built from past disappointments. So you have to examine your distrust in order to have the courage to take new trust building steps. Now, I wonder if that explains why uh, the music that we hear in our 20s carries with us our entire life. We really don't change genres. Yes. And also, you know, the haircut that you had in your 20s and and the the styles and things. Yes. The things you find attractive in other people. Exactly. So we're always learning from rewards. And when you're young, you learn that a certain look or certain culture or style gets rewards and another style gets spurned or disdained. And it's like, whoa, I don't want to do that. So then any style that's out of style long enough comes back in style because the people who were alive who disdained it. And I wrote this blog post. um, My son was wearing shorts that my father wore in the 1950s that I have old pictures. So whatever has been out of style long enough my my father's clothing ended up in thrift shops when my father died and hipsters like my son go to thrift shops and buy these clothes and then designers copy what the hipsters are wearing so i call it the cycle of life <laughs> now let's let's talk about anxiety you wrote a whole book about anxiety and i think anxiety is probably the number one uh preemptor uh, from salespeople becoming really good. They're, they're scared of rejection, uh, failure, 
Um, you know, because today uh, people either don't pick up the phone or they feel very comfortable hanging up or just not responding uh, because they get bombarded with communications. Uh, how do people go about managing their anxiety? Okay, um, I'll give you two examples. So one from perspective of my personal life and one from the perspective of a goat. <laughs> okay, so... Um, <laughs> two very so, common. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I was in a class when I was training to be a zoo docent um, and I trained a goat to climb a seesaw to get a reward on the other side. And when the goat gets to the top of the seesaw, it feels that the seesaw starts to um, pivot. And it's like, whoa, that's scary. You know, and that fear is like, you know, it's, it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah. And, but that goat wanted that reward so much. And you can see like it froze and yeah. then it went for it. And then the goat got the reward at the end and then it zoomed around the seesaw to do it again. Because once you get that reward, then you overcome that fear and then it feels so good that you want to do it again. So it's really um, breaking fearful things down into small steps that are small enough that you can get the reward. And then once you get the reward, you build positive expectations, which stimulates your dopamine, and then it's easier to do it again. Now, I know this sounds like the cliche of like they say, you know, if you make 100 cold calls, then you'll get or and, and that, that becomes that's, the, I think, the wrong approach, because yeah, that yeah, yeah. because you're getting immediate rejection instead of reward. Yeah. So what I was fortunately taught at one point was the idea of um, focusing, um, building your one, your first hundred or thousand true fans. Yeah. And so my immediate reward was the joy of creating what I'm creating. Now, I have to say that I did this after I retired when I was free to not focus on short run rewards. And I just felt like I enjoy what I'm creating and I'm not going to quantify it. And over time, I kept taking small steps and I gradually got rewards and I could never tell what worked, but so many things didn't work. And when I tried to analyze what worked, it was very hard. So I just kept taking steps because I kept defining those steps in a way that I can enjoy them. How can I enjoy writing that next email? Or how can I bribe myself to give myself a cookie after writing 10 emails, but a healthy cookie? And just keep taking the steps and keep having fun rather than trying to think I'm going to be a big hero. And then it took years to finally accumulate into something. How about as far as like bringing yourself into the current moment? Because anxiety is the fear of the future, where depression is, uh, you know, digging up the past. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, because there's a lot of either meditation or mindfulness that gets people first in the current moment. Yeah, I understand what, what you're saying. Um, I don't 100% agree with this perspective because what I always say is we have two brains because we need both. So the human brain can anticipate the long-term consequences of what you're doing. So from an animal brain perspective, if you're a lion and you chase a gazelle and the gazelle gets away and then you chase another gazelle and that gazelle gets away, you're, you're hungry. And if you watch nature videos, you see that those lions don't eat for a week sometime. And when you're hungry, cortisol, uh, pay, uh, hunger is cortisol. So that, that creates a full body feeling of threat. So that's what we're experiencing when we have a few failures. And your human brain says, whoa, if I don't figure out what went wrong and connect it, and correct it, then I'm going to die of starvation, which is what you know, the nonverbal cortisol feeling. And, but I can't figure out what went wrong. So you really are looking for a pattern. That's what the human brain is designed to do. The pattern is what did I do wrong and how do I correct it? But often you can't figure that out. So 
my, but I have to give my human brain something to feel better. Yeah. So what I give it is to say, I'm going to do one thing different. And if that doesn't work, I'm going to do one other thing different. So I can't necessarily predict the future and predict what will work. But everyone who has ever succeeded just kept doing one thing different. And so that's a way that I help my two brains work together. Yeah, because it reminds me kind of like the old runner's trick is, you know, you wake up and it's cold outside and it's nice warm bed. If you start thinking about the runner's high, uh, it's nothing compared to that warm pillow, right? <laughs> so what you try and do is just like think of anything but the running and just get one leg out of the bed, get the other leg out of the bed, put the socks, put the shorts on, put the sneakers on, walk downstairs, get something to drink, just get outside that door you know, put, put some ear pods in it and that little step and just trick your mind into just don't, I don't have to run. I just have to walk. I don't have to walk far, just another, you know, block. And before you know it, you're running. And then before you know it, you're enjoying the run. And you're having good, you're having a good time. Yeah. And, I, and that's different from the other strategy you often hear about is visualize yourself winning marathons or something. Exactly. That if you give yourself grandiose rewards in your mind, they don't stimulate dopamine once you realize that you're not getting closer to the reward. Yeah. So if you have a reward that's too big and you're not approaching it, then your brain says, no way, I'm, you're not tricking me with that. And so intermediate rewards and immediate rewards are very useful. Yeah. And, and that's probably why New Year's resolutions don't work. It's just, it's too much, too fast, and there's no reward. Yeah. But I really focus on making things fun. Yeah. So um, making your run fun. And um, I discussed this with my husband for a long time because I, I said, why don't you listen to audiobooks while you're running? And he said, why well, I could never concentrate on what, and, and then finally I said, let's just try it. So he tried it and now he loves it. Yeah. And, and, and when I get, you know, there's always these threats, you get a lot of pressure from management. Yeah. Uh, customers don't always move as fast as we'd like them to, or do what they say they're going to do. How do we keep that yeah. cortisol? Yeah. 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 Okay, so um, I could talk theoretically about cortisol, but that's in my book. So get that in my books. Tame Your Anxiety is the book about that. Well, all my books have that. But let's talk practically for salespeople. So, you know, your boss is a jerk, your coworkers are jerks, and your bill collectors are jerks. So, but let's think about, so how do you live in a world full of jerks? If, you know, getting into the way your brain is seeing it. So one is live within your means, <laughs> you know, uh, which uh, from a theoretical perspective is focus on rewards that you have control over and limit threats by having control over them. And what I say is that a gazelle always lives in a world full of predators. It can never control the predators. It can never make a perfect world. So what does it do? It has confidence in its own skills. That's the yeah. only stress reliever we have. So if you live within your means, then you have confidence in your ability to pay your own bills. <laughs> That's really all that we have. Same with your boss. If you say, my boss will always be a flawed mammal. I will never have control over them. My coworkers will always be flawed mammals. I will never have control over them. But I have the skills to get a new job if need be, and I have confidence in that. But for now, I'm going to get the best out of the situation I'm in. And how do people make this kind of a, a daily habit? Because, you know, reading your book and knowing it is good, but you're not going to, unless you do it every day in some way have yeah. some kind yeah. of uh, reinforcement, habit building, you, you'll, you'll, it'll dissipate. And then three months you go, I better read that book again. Yeah. Right. So right. to make it a habit, um, that's a different book of mine called Habits <laughs> of a Happy Brain. And it explains why, uh, again, as I said, the habits build effortlessly when you're young, 
which is why we're so driven by our early habits. And the simple example of that is that you can speak your native language effortlessly, despite the fact that if you've ever been around a young child, they work very hard to build those neural pathways to create that native language. Now, when you try to learn a foreign language, you're aware of the difficulty of the work, and many people give up. So it's the same thing with emotional learning, that your emotional habits of youth were learned without conscious intent, but later on you can build new emotional habits, but it's as hard as learning a new language. And so what I explain in the book is you can build new habits with repetition, design the habits you need, and start with very small habits so that you can build your confidence and your power to do it and first design a habit that stimulates a happy chemical that you already feel comfortable with and then design a small one with one that you're less comfortable with and you just keep building on that. And in the book, you say 45 days. Is that what you feel is the the right amount of time? I do think so. Now, the idea is of course, you're intending to do it the rest of your life. But in 45 days, it will get easier. But for those first 45 days, it will not feel good. And so you have to repeat something that doesn't feel good, knowing that it will eventually feel easier. So the simple example is eating a cookie will feel good. Eating a carrot doesn't feel good. But after 45 days of going for the carrot, in the moment that you have that desire to nosh on something, then you'll feel good about that habit. And the carrot is not a habit that I'm suggesting per se. In the book I talk about, in all my books, I talk about designing the habit that feels good to you. So if it's not a carrot, you will design something that builds on happy circuits that you already myelinated in your childhood. And is it part just to constantly reinforce that this is the way your brain works versus trying to wonder, you know, the difference between science and like, you know, folklore, like astrology, something that's people believe in, but there's nothing behind it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so there's that um, higher power. And, uh, you know, I'm not um, criticizing any beliefs in higher powers, but you have to have on some level some belief in your own power, even if you think that the higher power has given you your own power, but you have to honor your own power. And a nice way of calling that is self-acceptance. So, so much of what we hear today is what I call the disease model, which is I'm broken, something is wrong with me, and instead of believing in my own power, I believe in the doctor's going to fix me. Give me a and pill. that's so unhealthy. So we have to believe in our own power instead of just blaming our brokenness on something external. And now, how about things like depression? You know, because, and, and certainly this happens to salespeople all the time. They get kind of frozen in depression. Uh, they've had a bad quarter or three bad quarters in a row. And th- it's hard to, you know, get up and get going again. Is there a way or a particular process that people should go through to break that? Uh, yeah. So I talk about short run rewards, lo- um, short run goals, long run goals, and middle term goals. And if you establish clearly in your mind um, all three of them, and you can always change them, but you will always be stepping toward a goal if you have a few different goals to shift among. And then you will always be stimulating the good feeling of dopamine. Now, you also need a serotonin goal. Serotonin is the feeling of pride in your own power, confidence in your own skills. And it's hard to have that after you've had a few disappointments. So you can take up a new hobby and feel pride and confidence in that. It doesn't have to be work-related. So anything that builds your own confidence in your own skills in the short run, in the long run, and always be stimulating it because these chemicals 
are gone and metabolized as soon as you stimulate them, which is why we're always driving ourselves crazy to stimulate them again and again. And the other thing is give yourself permission to focus on meeting your own needs. You can't meet other people's needs. You can't judge your life by your ability to meet your own needs. And you can't feel guilty about focusing on your own needs because that's how your brain is designed to work. And you may have been indoctrinated that it's wrong to focus on your own needs, but that's the brain we've inherited. Yeah. And the other people who want you to focus on their needs, they're focused on their needs. That's the point. Yeah. <laughs> that's why they are. Yeah. Now, what I find is that as humans, I think the default is that we're reactive instead of proactive. And to do this, to first be aware that our brain is full of these chemicals, and that's really what's going on up there. And for us to take uh, control over it and to have a compounding effect versus a cyclical effect, mm -hmm. right? Where, okay, now we get used to it. Now we slide back and we, until we slide like the thermostat down to a certain degree, then the heat comes on and then we stop and then we, until the heat comes on. And I think that's the nature of people is that, yeah. that thermostat effect. Okay. Yeah. So I talk in all of my books about the treadmill effect. So the reason is our brain is designed to focus on the unmet need. So it doesn't reward you for focusing on needs that you've already met. So if you're dying of thirst in the desert, water is thrilling, even if you see an oasis 10 miles away. But once you have unlimited running water, it doesn't make you happy. So in the modern world, our physical needs are easily met. So we focus on social needs. And that's an endless struggle because whatever social need you've already met, then your brain takes that for, for granted and focuses on a new social need. So when you realize that this treadmill thing is going on, then you can just notice that you're doing it and say, oh, I, I, don't, I don't have to do that. I can celebrate what I'm doing and not wait for the world to celebrate me. And how about as far as like having a, a compounding effect, meaning that like putting a deposit in the bank where you get now get interest on your interest uh, instead of, okay, I, I'm no longer depressed. I'm even keeled. I'm no longer anxious. I'm here, but each day gets a little bit better. Like that you are building on it versus uh, starting over and just band-aiding each thing. Have you thought of like kind of a, you know, a building brick, a foundation type of way of doing that? Uh, yeah. So in Habits of a Happy Brain, I talk about the idea that um, positive expectations help your, um, uh, your uh, happy chemicals turn on more easily in daily life. And understanding your cortisol circuits helps you avoid defaulting to that survival threat feeling. That's also covered in Tame Your Anxiety. And I have another book called The Science of Positivity, Stop Negative Thought Patterns by, training, by Changing Your Brain Chemistry. That's probably the best one for what you just said. So the whole idea that um, we default to negative thinking is something that we wire in in youth because it got rewarded, either because the people around you defaulted to negative thinking, and also a lot of this comes naturally because in history, mammals were always threatened and had to be on guard. So to have a, a positive default circuit, it's anyone can build it, but maybe you will be criticized for building it because the people around you will say, who do you think you are? You think you're better than us? So you have to be willing to feel okay, even if the others around you don't feel okay. And that's scary because then you're not one of the crowd when you're having optimism. Cool. Hey, this has been a great conversation. Where should people start with your, your books? Is, is it a certain order they should go in or is it? Uh... Oh, thanks. Well, you can go to my website, innermammalinstitute.org innermammalinstitute.org. And all my resources are there. They're all free except for the books. 
And I have some videos that are only 35 minutes long, five minute videos that gives you the whole story really fast. And a lot of people react and have, say, oh, I have a friend who needs to know this. And, and you can give your friend that five minute video. But the books, I would start with Habits of a Happy Brain because that's the simplest introduction. It's also available on audio. And then keep going. Great. Hey, I really appreciate your time today. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.